In today's video, we're going to take a look at the basics of the IQ modulator. We'll look at the block diagram and then describe and demonstrate its operation. We'll use the modulator to generate a couple of different types of modulation. And then we'll take a look at some of the impairments that might affect the operation of the modulator and look at those effects in the resulting modulated output. And then finally, we'll run a single sideband suppression test, which is a pretty common performance test that's uh, used to characterize uh, IQ modulators. Now it's important for you to have a pretty basic understanding of IQ signals as well as how a diode ring mixer works in order to get the most out of this video. If you're not familiar with those topics, I recommend going and viewing these kind of prerequisite videos beforehand and then come back and take a look at this. If you want to do a little bit of extra study, there's a couple of additional videos that uh, might be helpful, some more on IQ signals, the basics of mixers themselves, and uh, I did a video on the, the diode mixer LO drive level. I'll put links to each of these videos in the description of the video down below. Now here's a block diagram of a typical quadrature modulator like this one from Mini Circuits. The local oscillator signal comes in and goes into something like maybe a quadrature hybrid or maybe even a splitter and a delay line or 90 degree phase shifter to create the in phase and quadrature LOs that are applied to the mixers. Now the best way to understand the operation of the modulator is to consider these mixers as multipliers. So essentially here we've got the product of the in phase LO and the I component, so I times cosine and the output of this mixer is essentially Q times the quadrature LO or the sine wave. So after the summation of those signals we have the sum of I times cosine and Q times sine. Now of course as the I and Q signals are varied over time that's essentially what creates the modulated RF signal at the output here. In order to demonstrate the operating principles of the IQ modulator rather than use this pre-built one we'll use this one that I put together here with some basic components. Uh, I've got a pair of uh, diode ring mixers. These are uh, ADE-1ASKs from Mini Circuits. So they're uh, right here and here. I'm driving the LO inputs of those mixers through a pair of connectors here that are going to a two-channel function generator that allows me to generate uh, sine waves that are in quadrature. So I'll use those instead of a quadrature hybrid. This will allow me to kind of take a look then at what happens if those signals are not in quadrature later on. The output of each of these mixers then goes into an RF splitter combiner right here and then the output from that we're going to take to the oscilloscope and the spectrum analyzer to go take a look at things. Okay, we can see we've got three active traces on the oscilloscope, uh, channel 1, 2, and 3. And where they're coming from is uh, channel 1 is looking at the uh, in-phase LO signal, channel 2 is looking at the quadrature LO signal, and channel 3 is looking at the output of the splitter combiner. All right, we can see that the channel 1, the in-phase uh, local oscillator, is essentially our cosine wave. And then 90 degrees off from that is our quadrature LO signal. And they're both coming from the function generator. Channel 3 is the output of the combiner. Now right now we've got nothing applied to the I and the Q inputs, so they're effectively zero. And again, if we think about those mixers as multipliers, zero times either one of these gives me zero, so that's why we have nothing at the output. Now to demonstrate the basic principle of these mixers in the modulator, I've just hooked up a simple variable DC power supply to the I input. Well, let's take a look at the effect of that as we turn this voltage up. Now with zero volts applied to the I and the Q inputs, we essentially get nothing out because the mixers are multiplying by zero. If we apply a small DC bias to the I input, we can now see an output that comes out that's exactly mirroring the ILO, or the in-phase local oscillator. Now that local oscillator signal has dropped in amplitude. And the reason for that is because by turning these diodes on, we're now allowing the function generator to look through the mixer and actually see the 50 ohm termination on the other end of it. So that's what's reducing the amplitude of the uh, I signal here. So now let's look at what happens if I reduce that uh, DC input amplitude and reverse its polarity and apply it in the opposite polarity. So now with uh, about a negative 300 millivolts applied, I'm getting an output, but now it's 180 degrees out of phase from the, inf uh, from the ILO. So by varying the input to the mixer between a positive value and a negative value, we can get either an in-phase or 180 degree out of phase signal uh, from the I side of the IQ modulator. Of course, similarly, if we apply a positive DC bias to the Q input, 
we're going to get an output that is in phase with the Q local oscillator. And if we reverse that polarity, we'll get an output that is 180 degrees out of phase of the Q. So we can see that we're getting, uh, can vary between uh, in phase and 180 degrees out of phase of the I and the Q, and those two signals are going to be the ones that are applied to the uh, summing circuit to create our modulated output. Now if I apply the same DC bias to both inputs, I essentially get another sinusoid out, but now its phase shift is midway between the I and the Q. And that's the whole idea. When we adjust the magnitude of the I and Q uh, products in the modulator, by varying their magnitude, we'll get a sine wave output whose phase can be varied to anywhere between plus and minus 180 degrees, depending on the magnitude of each I and Q component. In order to demonstrate a couple of basic digital modulation types, I'm using the IQ signals that come out of my vector signal generator. I'm going to apply them to the I and Q inputs of my quadrature modulator. But in between, uh, on the I input, I'm going to give myself the ability to inject a DC offset, so we'll take a look at the effect of that. And on the Q input, I've given myself the ability to adjust its magnitude independent of the I signal, and we'll take a look at the effect of that on the modulation as well. But the first thing we'll do is just apply them directly over and take a look at some basic digital modulations. So now in this case, uh, I've got the Q signal sitting at essentially at zero volts, but the I signal is varying between some negative value and some positive value with this kind of binary pattern. And this is going to create a binary phase shift keyed signal. Where we're going to have the RF output be at one phase during a low and at 180 degrees out of phase during a high. Let's zoom in on this and actually see that. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and take a look at uh, one of these transitions. I'm going to add in a reference signal here that might make it a little bit easier to see what's going on. This uh, green square wave I've just added uh, is not affected by the modulation, so we can compare the phase of the output with respect to that. And we can see that while the I uh, input was high, the peak of my carrier is occurring you know, right about at the rising edge or just after the rising edge of the square wave. And as we transition down through zero, we can see that uh, the carrier collapses down to nothing. And as we go down negative, now the peak of that carrier is occurring 180 degrees later uh, during the, uh, right, at, right after the low of the square wave. So we've basically created binary phase shift keying, alternating the phase between zero and 180 degrees between the high and the low. Now in this case the uh, I signal is filtered. If we unfilter it, make it transition a lot faster, it's a little bit more obvious that the uh, abrupt phase transition that we're getting between the uh, zero and 180 degree phase states. But in most systems uh, the baseband signals, the I and Q signals, are filtered. Uh, to slow down the phase transitions and that helps to minimize how much bandwidth the signal occupies. Now if we add in a similar signal to the Q, now I've got I and Q signals that are both varying between a positive and negative value uh, with again, essentially a digital pattern. And what this is going to result in now is four different states of the phase. Uh, one when both the I and Q are sitting low, another when they're both sitting high, and then two more when the I is high and Q is low, and then another when the Q is high and I is low, like right here. Again, let's zoom in and take a look at those. Now, this is known as QPSK, or Quadrature Phase Shift Keying, and a very, very common uh, digital modulation method. And uh, we're zoomed in uh, right up here, where both I and Q are sitting at a negative value. And we can see the peak of my RF uh, signal is occurring kind of towards the tail end of the low portion of my square wave reference here. If we scoot over one more bit here, here both I and Q are, are positive, and now we can see the phase has shifted 180 degrees from where it was here, now that the peak is occurring towards the tail end of the high side of my reference waveform. We look at the two opposite states here. Uh, here we have the Q signal is high, the I is low, and we can see my positive peak is kind of lined up with this falling edge of the square wave. And if we uh, go and take a look at the opposite state here, I is high and Q is low. Now I can see that the peak is lined up with the rising edge of the, uh, my square wave reference. So we can see there are four separate phase states, each of them separated by 90 degrees. And again, this is a quadrature phase shift keyed uh, modulation.
Now in order to take a look at some of the effects of some impairments that can happen such as a DC offset between the I and the Q or a gain offset between the I and the Q or even a quadrature offset within the modulator it's best to look at this in the modulation domain so we're going to introduce the vector signal analyzer here and take a look at our signal with that. I'm using my Tektronics RSA607A real-time spectrum analyzer to take a look at the effect of some impairments on the IQ modulator. Okay, so we're looking at uh, a couple of different views of this modulated signal. There's the kind of average spectrum, the live real-time spectrum, the demodulated I and Q waveforms, and the constellation diagram which essentially shows the four uh, phases of this RF signal. Now the first impairment we'll look at is a DC offset between the I and Q waveforms. If I inject that DC offset, uh, there isn't a whole lot that's visible. The constellation diagram doesn't change very much, but if you look carefully, you see a little bit of a peak popping up here on the spectrum, and it's visible here as well, and that's known as carrier leakage. Uh, now, carrier leakage is not that big of a deal for a simple modulation like BPSK or QPSK in this case, but it can be a very big deal for things like OFDM and that type of a thing. Now, the next impairment we'll take a look at is IQ gain imbalance, and that's where the I and Q magnitudes aren't the same. So if I introduce a little bit of attenuation into uh, one of the I and Q waveforms, you can actually see a you know, different amplitude here now, and we can see what it does to the constellation. It actually squishes it in one direction or the other. So instead of being lined up perfectly at our four equidistant constellation points, we've got less gain in one direction compared to the other. And again, that's IQ gain imbalance. Now the last impairment we'll take a quick look at is quadrature error. And this is uh, referring to the I and Q sine waves that are going to the two mixers. They're supposed to be exactly 90 degrees apart, and we get a nice perfect constellation when that happens. If there is a phase shift that is not 90 degrees between them, this is what can happen. You can get a skew in almost like a parallelogram effect in the constellation diagram, and that's an indication of quadrature error. Let me reverse it and go in the other direction here introducing a phase shift in the wrong direction here. So this is what can happen when you've got a phase shift that is not 90 degrees between your quadrature LOs. Now, oftentimes if you're testing a quadrature modulator chip or a module like this, you won't have access to all the various points and adjustments we did in this video. So a common thing to do is to do a single sideband suppression test. And in that case, we apply our carrier signal to the local oscillator input. We apply a pair of sinusoids in quadrature to the I and Q inputs, uh, and then we take a look at the RF output. And ideally, the RF output is going to give us a tone that is offset from the carrier frequency by an amount equal to the frequency of the I and Q. But of course, nothing's ideal, so we're going to get a little bit of carrier feed through, or carrier leakage, I should say, as well as some uh, magnitude of signal on the opposite sideband. In this case, it's the upper sideband. If we wanted to reverse this, all we'd have to do is change uh, which signal is leading the I and the Q of the inputs to the quadrature modulator here. So the figure of merit is how far down this opposite sideband is suppressed compared to the desired sideband. Now I didn't do anything in my setup here to optimize the phase shift between my I and Q input signals, so this could possibly potentially be a bit better than the 37 dB down that I'm measuring here. But that's essentially what the single sideband suppression test is. and. Uh, various impairments, the uh, IQ offset, the IQ imbalance, uh, and, uh, and DC offset will affect the levels of the carrier feed through and the single sideband suppression. So it's more of a composite uh, measurement of all of these errors or all these impairments kind of rolled up into one. Well, I hope this video gave you a little bit of insight into what an IQ modulator is, uh, how it works, and how some of the impairments of an IQ modulator will manifest themselves in their performance that they produce. Thanks again for watching. If you like what you see, as always, please give me a thumbs up. Tell your friends. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.